Stuart, you've got your uh, PowerPoint. We're going to go, yeah. go to that first. Sure, I can. All right. And do we need UG to uh, comment on some of the photos or is that for later? No, I mean, it's it's pretty self It's for later. He can comment if he chooses. It's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Some old stuff there. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. We welcome you to the Monday, November 30th edition of uh, Track Announcers Notebook. Uh, Pat Gonzalez, along with uh, my co-host, Stuart Nodell. Uh, as you know, the MotoGP season wrapped up uh, a week ago yesterday uh, in Portugal at the uh, track they call Porto Mayo. It's actually the Algarve Motorsport Park. I had the chance to visit there when I was in Portugal in uh, 2019. It's uh, an amazing uh, motor racing facility built in 2008. And that's where the, uh, the championship uh, all wrapped up. We're going to get into the riders, the championship, the season. It's our pleasure to have our uh, very own uh, Canadian uh, via his uh, Japanese ancestry and now a citizen of the world, considering all of the racetracks and all of the countries he's been to over the last 15 or so years. Our pleasure to have Yuji Kikuchi with us tonight on Track Announcers Notebook. And uh, Yuji, uh, welcome back to the show. You were on much earlier in the season. Lots transpired uh, since you were on the show. Uh, we'll, we'll get through some of these photos there in a minute, but... Uh, was the season what you thought it was going to be heading to that uh, first round? Uh, hi, Pat. Thank you. Um, the season has been just been so different this year. Uh, it's been very unique. Uh, the uh, the entire season. Um, I don't know how to explain. It was it was just a, a very strange season. It, we ended up doing. You know about 15 races or so but uh but it definitely didn't uh, feel like any other year <laughs> well i'm i'm sure it uh, it wasn't uh take us through almost side by side a year ago what was a typical race weekend like and then what was a typical race weekend under covid what were the biggest differences uh, as as somebody involved with uh, with the Honda HRC team. Okay, well, I mean, typical. Uh, I, I guess I would say that the biggest difference is that we don't have any spectators. So the uh, the paddock is is pretty quiet. You know, there's no signing um, um, uh, sessions or uh, pit tours or uh, people coming by. Uh, um, you know, friends uh, visiting the, the, the circuits and stuff. There's none of that going on. Um, we have to go through some um, COVID-19 uh, protocol where we have to take uh, tests to make sure that we are negative before we allow entry into the, to the paddock. And, um, and so the, uh, the biggest difference was right from the beginning where we needed uh, to prove to the um, uh, uh, Dorna facility that the, we are uh, we are negative with our tests, and then that will allow us into the to the paddock and to continue on with the, with the race weekend. Um, the work started at in in at, in Wednesday morning, and the uh, and race of course on Sunday. But um, um, I guess the biggest difference was that the, the, the crowd wasn't there and. Uh, and we weren't really allowed to go out for dinners and 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 have a freedom of being outside. Uh, we needed to be in the bubble, so uh, all our meals were at the track and prepared uh, for us. It was like a, a box lunch type of thing, and and we went with that from in you know lunch and dinner type of thing uh, all the way to the race goes, and and we went on for. 
the entire season in that sort of fashion. What about uh, so, accommodation? Was there a designated uh, bubble hotel or what was uh, what was that like uh, in between the days at the racetrack? Yes, uh, a lot of the hotels were, I'm sure they were designated by Dorna. Um, uh, so we had shared a lot of um, a lot of these places with other team or the, or the Dorna officials. And, and, um, and so they tried to uh, keep us all contained in one bubble, make sure that we are, if we are tested negative, then we stay inside and, and uh, we don't uh, bring any of the, you know, the, the virus in to, uh, so that we can continue. So yes, the hotels were pretty much designated. And, and how often did you have to go through uh, a COVID test and was there temperature screenings every day you went to the track? How intense was that, uh, that process? Uh, well, it was intense in the beginning, but we kind of got used to it. Um, but what we had was uh, MotoGP uh, supplied us with, it, with an app for our phone. And, um, and then prior to the race weekend, which for us, we start on Wednesday morning. But on Monday morning, which is 48 hours prior to it, we go and take our PCR test, which is a swab test. And from that, we get the results in time. And if it is negative, this, this app will show a green light. And, and our green light will allow us to go inside uh, to, uh, to do the work. But um, yeah, the temperature checks were definitely every day about the LV entrances uh, and then the app to make sure that we are all green. And then, um, you know, it was mandatory for us to uh, get the disinfectant, you know, on our hands on our way in to, to, uh, for an extra shot of make sure that, uh, that I, you know, we're, we're clean and, and disease free. What about mask wearing when you're actually at the racetrack working on the bikes, the sessions in pit road? Yes, well, masks are absolutely mandatory for everybody that was there. Um, the only persons that were allowed to have the mask off were the riders in this session. And then uh, in that case, when, when a rider didn't have the mask on, the, uh, the chief engineers who discussed things with them or the suspension engineers, they, they needed to have a mask and a face shield or an eye protection also. Uh, so they had a clear shield on. Um, with the masks and then um, so that they can talk to the rider who didn't have the, the mask on. But the rest of us uh, needed, needed all the gear, so the mask was always on. And in, in terms of going from race to race, what, uh, what was that like in between uh, races? Were you, were you flying? Were you just going uh, by, by road? What were the protocols uh, in between the various 15 races that you managed to get in? Um, well, depending on the location, if we needed to fly, uh, a lot of the flights were arranged by Dorna. So we had charter flights from small airports and we, we, we transported basically in, in groups. And um, uh, if we, when we were driving, uh, of course we were able to you know, drive by town, but either way we needed to take the test on Monday to make sure that we were okay before we got into the circuit. So um, when we had to fly, a lot of it was, uh, a lot of it was charter. Uh, and if not, the, you know, the driving, we were, we were kind of on our own, but we had to make sure that uh, we stayed clean. Yeah, I think your home base for Honda LRC is in, is it Monte Carlo? Uh, Honda LCR, they got the office in Monte Carlo, um, but uh, the workshop uh, where the things are is in uh, in San Marino, which is not so far from Misano Circuit. Right. Um, but the but the trailers probably didn't go back um, all season long. It, wow. Uh, pretty much just trailed where 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 we went, and a, and a driver will uh, get to the next destination or or um, had permission from either at the, the the track we were in or the next track to to kind of park our trucks and and uh, and stay there. So, um, so some of the guys got to go home, but uh, but the trucks pretty much stayed. So then, any work that you were doing prior to Wednesday was that being done in that parking lot on a Monday or a Tuesday? Like how uh, how crazy was the schedule? Just getting the bikes 
prepped and any changes you were making uh, earlier in the week before the next round, assuming you were going back to back? Right. Um, well, most of our services, um, we start from Wednesday. We have two days to uh, fix and rebuild and set up for that circuit for that any given weekend. And so this part hasn't really changed. So we'd have Monday and Tuesday off. Um, and then uh, okay. from Wednesday, Wednesday morning, we started work and uh, we are able to uh, completely set up and finish by Friday, uh, by, by Thursday night to be ready for Friday morning. So what are, you, what are you doing on a Monday and Tuesday when you do have a couple of, couple of days off? Uh, I, I assume COVID's restricting what you could do even to cease, uh, you know, some of that country, like when you're in Portugal, going to the Algarve and some of the beaches there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, didn't get to see the beach this year. Um, we have to we have to stay in our rooms in a hotel. Um, we had organized meals to to come down and and, and take the meals, and then uh, uh, we weren't allowed to leave. So pretty much uh, contained in our rooms. Um, you know, uh, sleep and watch videos and things like that. But <laughs> but uh, didn't get to get out and have you know the the great restaurants we know or uh the beaches that we like to see and things like that we never got to do that this year okay i'm gonna go to stuart and odell stuart i think we've got a couple of questions that have come in for you g and uh then i'll uh, i'll throw it over to you because i'm i'm sure you've got a few questions uh of uh of ug about uh, the 2020 season for sure thanks pat uh i'll go to our list here first uh stephen smart has uh, put in, he wanted to know if UG has a fitness routine he follows um, for following the circuit and on average, when he's at the track, how much sleep does he get on a night? And then what is your favorite track on the circuit? Wow, okay. Uh, first of all, um, I wish I was that organized to uh, keep myself in, in, a, in a, a training or a fitness regimen. Um, uh, I, I do whenever and whenever I can. Uh, and of course, I, I sleep as much as I can on, on the days off. But uh, but uh, as soon as the race week starts, you know, I, I'll get less and less sleep along the way all the way till Sunday. So uh, Monday is a good time for, for some sleeping in. Um, and um, Wednesdays and Thursdays, sometimes uh, we can take time to uh, walk around the track so we can jog or um, or we could uh, you know, just just walk around, check things out. But um, yeah, I don't really have a an organized uh, routine for myself. <laughs> and what about your favorite track on the circuit? Ah, oh, favorite track. Sorry, um, I, have, I have many favorite tracks. Um, I love Phillip Island. We didn't get to go this year. Um, Mugello is a, is a beautiful, beautiful track. Uh, and uh, and of course Jerez is just uh, just just reeks of Grand Prix uh, since the you know the 500 days. So there there are a few of my favorites, but um, but I definitely look forward to going to almost all of these uh, circuits. Awesome. There's uh, one other question we've got here. Is someone has asked if. Uh, you can explain a little clearer the the rule and fraction that Yamaha experienced with their engines uh, at the end of the season. The rule and fraction. Ah, okay. Um, from what I hear, um, Yamaha has had some uh, parts in the engine in the valve train part that uh, was basically defective, and and they were starting to wear, and so they were they were losing their engines, and they needed to repair that part. So what they did was they um, they improved on a, a from what I believe it was a, they changed the manufacturer to update uh, the part and so they uh, had to take on a penalty uh, to to continue but uh, I believe that it was it was our train and they really needed to um, to uh, uh, update the materials. Uh, so that they can move on to next year with it. Right. Okay. I, I guess for my, I guess the question I would have for you is um, with all of the, it seems like the young talent now is coming through the system, whether it be from Moto3 to Moto2 to Moto GP, 
every year. Um, who do you think next year will be the, the up and coming guy to really pay attention to? Wow. Um, yeah, they are coming up to the rankings. There are a lot of talented riders coming up and um, Moto2, I mean, we seem to, even even some of the, the veteran riders, even, you know, for like Sam Lowe is uh, showing a lot of uh, talent this year. Um, and uh, the riders that were in, in Moto3, um, I mean, Arenas, he got, he got his championship this year. Um, fabulous, just fantastic riders. And I think, um, you know, th there are, there are many up and coming. I mean, I can't really say who is who is going to be, you know, guaranteed uh, next world champion type of thing. But uh, but I do see, um, you know, in their second season and 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 or their third season, and, and they have actually seemed to have found something, and it's clearly they are riding better. And so. Um, I don't know. They're they're all there. Uh, Moto three. There's few riders coming up, and there's Moto two. There's there's definitely few riders coming up. Uh, Moto GP's class. There's a lot of young riders now, and um, we're just kind of waiting for some of these riders to start start improving, and uh, hopefully we'll see that next year as well. UG, what's the and, uh, sorry? I was going to ask, what's the uh, situation? Uh, next year, uh, who takes over on the uh, on the Honda from Cal uh, Crutchlow after uh, you worked with him for six years? And uh, what was it like uh, being there with Kyle uh, Cal during a very strange season for his uh, you know sort of a re a Rivaderci tour of MotoGP this year? Yeah. Um... Yeah, we had a very difficult year with Cali. He had some injuries uh, back in Jerez, uh, where he was able to, he wasn't able to race a, a couple of them. Um, but it, it says it was a strange year for him. I I wish that uh, we had a, a bit more like a fair shot at the, at the season, but it um, fortunately didn't turn out this way. Um, uh, next year, uh, LCR will be having uh, Alex Marquez. Uh, from from the Repsol team to come over, uh, since Paul Espargaro always is going to be coming into to the Repsol team in replacement. So I'll be working with Alex next year, uh, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that. Indeed, um, when you look back over the season, I don't think anybody would have predicted that Mark Marquez was going to crash out at the very first event. But as as bad as that was, it really gave the season a whole new look with all these different race winners and KTM and Suzuki moving up. Uh, I think it had to be the most competitive uh, championship in decades. And w when I looked at the final standings between uh, the fourth ranked rider uh, uh, and ninth was only 10 points. So uh, so many different podium uh, groupings over the over the 15 rounds. Uh, could you see that coming once Mark Marquez, uh, who was obviously the pre-race favorite to win a championship again, uh, that it would be that wild and crazy and you never knew who was going to win on what bike any given weekend? Well, this year with, with, uh, with all these winners, different winners and, and all these races, uh, Never imagined that it was going to turn out this way. Uh, it, it was some really, really exciting races. It was great to see all these different winners. Um, and uh, when, when Mark had gotten injured back in the Jerez, uh, you know, Fabio Corratorado was showing really, uh, showing a lot of strength. He was really fast. Uh, and it, it appears that he was going to start walking away for the championship. And I think a lot of people have thought about that too. Um, Maverick Vinales is, is uh, you know, has has his days when he's really strong too. So um, I think you know a lot of people thought about the usual uh, contenders 
you know, when, when Mark stepped off, the ones that were fighting Mark were probably gonna gonna come up and, and start winning all the races. But um, but uh, interestingly, it didn't turn out that way. And and I think uh, you know the the this the fact that the Mark you know Mark wasn't in 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 the in in the race, I, I think brought on a lot of an energy for for some of these riders that uh, that they can they could be competitive and they could you know come up and win. So you know the the way it turned out was completely amazing, and uh, and uh, I never would have imagined that it was going to be like this. So Earlier. it was uh, it, it was great to see some of these races. It was fabulous race. Yeah, I, I saw a little bit of it and I, I did catch the last round and something you mentioned a little bit earlier, the biggest difference was just the silence, if you will, other than the sound of the motorcycles with no fans there. And I was just thinking about that last round where Miguel Oliveira, Portuguese rider, wins on his home track and I'm sure he had probably more experience on the uh, uh, racetrack there in Porto Mayo and he wins. Uh, there should have been a hundred thousand screaming Portuguese, but it was like the Simon and Garfunkel song, "The Sound of Silence." Um, yeah. That must have been uh, seemed like really strange that day. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That uh, I mean, all the races throughout throughout this year, um, lots of good races, different winners, and and normally. Uh, you know, there would have been fans screaming, and like you said, uh, you know, Miguel, that was his second win because he 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 had won, you know, back in in Austria this year, and he's a rookie rider, and uh, and the fact that he he was so strong and he won this last round, uh, normally would have, you know, all the the local fans just going crazy, but uh, none of that was there, so it's a it's a it's a really strange feeling that. Um, there were no spectators there. Earlier, you were talking uh, that you uh, really known as a transmission specialist. Uh, one of my uh, uh, sort of bird dogs, if you will, told me that going back 10 years ago, Honda had uh, an advantage in terms of some technology in the gearbox and the transmissions. And you would show up with this secret attach a case <laughs> with with these trick transmissions that were apparently worth a second, a second and a half a lap. Uh, can you divulge anything, uh, even in general terms, as to what was going on back then and wh what's happened with the gearboxes on all of these machines uh, over the last five or 10 years? Um, okay. Uh, the device is called seamless transmission. Um, and um, it is, a little bit different from conventional gears, and it's the mechanism is such that when you're when you're shifting, there isn't so much of a, a shock uh, of engagement, and this helps the riders um, do their downshifting or or, or upshifting um, with ease, and while they're leaned over, and it helps them quite a bit without experiencing so much shift shock. Um, and so, um, a lot of these manufacturers, they do have their own type, you know, some, there are some manufacturers that make some for others as well, but, but Honda has their own design and, and I, and that's, that's been a proprietary, like a top secret type of thing. So, um, so I was, I'm, I'm assigned to, to work on these, uh, transmissions since the guys in the team are not allowed to see it. So uh, this is what I do. I when 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 we need to get the gearbox out, I you know I have a little a box that I can I take the gearbox out, put it the box in, and uh, and I'll go to my uh, my transmission room to 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 change the gears and then I bring it back and I put it in. The so, mad. Um, I was going to say the mad scientist and and uh, and technician. Now, are you doing that for just Cal or for all of the Honda teams? Um, no, I'm I'm doing it for Cal. Uh, okay. Right now, yeah. Right now, we have a transmission guy for every rider. Right now, I used to 
I have done it for for Nakagami as well. Uh, there was one year that I had uh, the two riders, uh, but it was super busy. So, so the so the next year they, they got one one uh, gearbox guy to ride it. Yeah, and do you so, compare um, do yeah. you compare notes with the other uh, transmission specialists on the other teams, or are you pretty much on your own? Uh, no, um, definitely all the information shared. Uh, all the when we look at the, the you know the the transmissions for maintenance and wears and things like that, the updates and those that's all shared definitely. Uh, even the gear ratios are shared among uh, all the Honda riders. Um, so. Um, yeah, there, there, there's no secrets uh, between the Honda riders, that's for sure. And are you are you changing things in the transmissions for every single racetrack? Uh, the gear ratios definitely. Yeah. Um, but uh, the you know the parts we 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 manage the the mileage on them. You know some some last a little bit longer than the others. So you know as the uh, as the mileage come up, we replace as much as necessary. But um, but the gear ratios, yes, we set up for uh, every every racetrack. Okay, I think Stuart's got a couple of more questions uh, for you, Yuji. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions here, and it, it kind of goes along the lines of what you guys were just talking about in the transmissions. And what the question was is, are the gearboxes the same for both the LCR and Repsol bikes? And are the is it the same gearbox for every track, or does every track have its own separate gearbox? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, the gearbox system itself uh, is is the same across the board for it was for Cal and the Repso guys uh, because the the three guys used uh, this year's bikes basically, and Nakagami, uh, the fourth Honda rider had last year's bike. And there are some little things different. Uh, basically, it was the older type uh, gearbox. But uh, the principle is the same. Uh, there's just little update things that were different for this year. Um, and um, so they are they are same across uh, as far as uh, uh, Cal with, with uh, the guys at Repsol this year. And uh, the gearbox, like I said, um, the ratios are, are different for every track. Um, and um, yeah, cassette type transmissions, so they can they can come out in under ten minutes, and uh, and uh, we can change between sessions every day. So uh, uh, it's uh, it's something that just kind of follows along with uh, the pace of the rider or the circumstance of the circuit for, for that given weekend. Right. And then Carol Swedish wanted me to let you know that uh, the RC30 is <laughs> waiting for you to ride it whenever you're available. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carol. I've been, I've been dying to get over there to have a look at that RC30. <laughs> uh, anything else in the Q&A? Again, for those uh, who are online here, I see uh, Stu Shaw, who uh, is out in uh, Vancouver, he is on with us tonight. Uh, so for Stu, Pat Barnes, anybody else, if you've got a question uh, about uh, <laughs> MotoGP, maybe a good restaurant uh, in Austin, Texas, assuming the MotoGP event happens at Coda and the borders open and some of us Canadian race fans uh, who are starved for live racing can get down there uh, in April. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, Coda, Yuji, that'll be, uh, you can almost go home uh, that, uh, that week to your own home. You're that close. But um, <laughs> what, what's the likelihood right now, based on what you know, that uh, the teams uh, will look at doing, I think it's Argentina and Coda in Austin, Texas on back-to-back -back weekends. I guess that's all going to depend on COVID. Otherwise, you might be looking at simply staying in Europe again uh, for most of the season. Yes, uh, that, that's pretty much right. Uh, uh, we have our, basically our, you know, a wish list of places where we want to go, and and uh, and depending on you know COVID situation, we won't be able to go to Argentina or or Dakota. So um, if it is in that case, we might just go back to Europe again for, for the season. Uh, but hoping that um, 
the pandemic will uh, improve a little bit and you know give us the opportunity to go back to Austin for the race. Uh, but it's a it's a great place to race. I think it's a uh, it's nice to be able to uh, have a race in in you know, in North America. So uh, looking forward to going going back there again. That's for sure. Okay, and Stuart, we got anything else there in the Q and A? Uh, just I, I guess the only question I had for for UG was just with regard to testing this year. Is there what is the plan for that, if any? Are you guys able to do testing um, as you normally would, since they're generally closed to the public anyhow, or is that limited as well? Uh, testing schedule has come out. We have proposed uh, for next year. There's going to be an out in Japan again. And then, uh, and also in Qatar, uh, but again, uh, we're gonna have to see how the condition of those countries are uh, nearing um, the times, and then to see what the whether there's gonna be restrictions or not, and whether MotoGP would like to go there. So we're gonna have to see. we have to see. Stuart, I think you got a couple of other questions that have come in before uh, we continue our conversation with Yuji. Yeah, we do. We a uh, couple of questions on the transmission topic still. Um, people want to know: Are the trans? Is it harder? Are the transmissions on the 500s were they harder on the 500s, or are the newer bikes harder on transmissions? Uh, I would have to say uh, the bikes now are definitely ha much harder on the transmissions, uh, simply because of the amount of horsepower and the torque applied to it. Um, uh, the you know the 500s used conventional gears uh, and they were much smaller in design I believe um, and um, and they were heavier so um, they both went through quite a bit of you know of, of power and torque I, I believe but um, but uh, the horsepower now and, and the torque applied to these gears are, are much much higher so I would have to say that um, the uh, the transmissions uh, the bikes now uh, would would um, apply a lot more force and it'd be harder on the transmissions. So uh, it's uh, part of my job is making sure that uh, these parts um, you know don't have the cracks in it or you know uh, that they are in good shape to take all the torque. Um, bikes also have uh, the 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 engineers who control the amount of torque being applied. In these gears, so uh, this also helps us uh, with um, how do you say the uh, well protecting it from uh, applying too much torque and breaking them. So yeah, it would definitely be more of GP. Interesting. We have a couple more couple more questions here, Pat. I can run through them here quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Is, I think we've lost Lou, uh, Yuji's uh, video, but hopefully that'll come back. Otherwise, uh, we've got him on radio here, just audio. Oh, okay. Uh, we've got uh, one question: is is the uh, is the IRTA a big help to the teams? Ah. Uh. I would have to say yes. Uh, <laughs> um, they they are how should I say? Um, they help with the structures in 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 organizing uh, the uh, how we go about with the entire race weekend, and um, they're also um, the ones that will negotiate with. Dorna to make sure that uh, it, uh, uh, all the decisions are fair and all the regulations are and you know uh, rules are applied in, in a fair manner. So I would have to say that uh, the IRTA people are are uh, doing a good job. I, and I think things have changed over the years, and I'm not really um, you know I, I haven't been there. Uh, in the 500 days when things are, I guess, a little bit different. But um, I'd have to say that yes, they are. They are helping with uh, keeping it, keeping it all together. <laughs> awesome. Um, do you still go to Japan for the bike updates? 
Um, yes, I do. Um, although next year I'm not scheduled to go uh, because of the pandemic, and uh, we're going to have to be doing a lot of the assembly in Malaysia, I think. But uh, normally, yes. Normally, at the beginning of the year, we go there to HRC and uh, we, we build all the bikes from scratch uh, and uh, build some of our spares before we actually get out to do the testing. And then we have one other topic from, I believe it's Marley McKinnon out east. And she's saying, hi, Yuji. And what is your favorite Canadian racetrack? <laughs> Oh my! Uh, I, I would have to say, uh, definitely one of my favorite is Shubenacadie. <laughs> the political, um, an the political <laughs> answer. Okay, UG, uh, you're you're having four lobsters shipped out uh, to McKinney, Texas tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> thumbs up right here. I don't know. I know. I know my uh, my camera's all frozen and all, but the thumbs up right here. I'm. Just <laughs> I love lobsters. <laughs> So it's uh, it's Shuby in the in the east. Oh yeah, as far as I remember, it's always been a, a great place. Uh, uh, the, the parties I remember is incredible. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was just it was just a great road trip, you know. Um, you know, it's a uh, love love Moss for and uh, and grew up, you know, going to Shannonville. So definitely, are you know they have a place in my heart. But um, you know, being able to go to Shubenacadie, you know, like when I was with Michael Taylor and and uh, being out to Shubi for the, for the race was just an incredible experience. And I just, such, such fun, you know, and crazy memories of Shubi. So, uh, yes, uh, I, I have to say Shubi is, uh, is, is definitely safe. Anything else there in the Q&A for UG uh, Stewart? Just one last one here, Pat, is um, what's your feeling towards Alex Marquez as a rider as, since you're going to be working with him next year? Okay, Alex is um, so a great, great rider. Uh, and he's, he's, he's super smart. And, and he's, he's really picked up on how to ride our Honda bike this year. So there's been some clear improvements. So um, he is, uh, I think he's excited to, to start another season. Um, and uh, also, uh, I'm looking forward to to working with with Alex. He's a he's a super nice guy, uh, and he's um, he's uh, very switched on. So uh, so I'm, I'm yeah I'm looking forward to to starting a season with him. UG, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier uh, about uh, Cal Crutchlow talented rider. Um, it's not too often that uh, you're still running MotoGP at age 35, much less uh, the doctor who I think uh, Valentino Rossi is going to give it a shot. One more year, I believe, is what I saw. Um, when you look at uh, the six years, and up until this year, Cal had been in the top 10 in MotoGP the previous uh, five seasons. And of course, uh, had a bit of a disappointing uh, year. Um, wh how, uh, where does he go from here? I understand he's still going to be involved in the sport. Uh, yes, Cal has signed uh, to be a test rider for Yamaha, um, as, which is great news, I think, for Yamaha. <laughs> Maybe not so good news for Honda, but uh, but I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna see uh, him him around, and I'm sure this. He's probably signed on to some wild card, you know, races and deals and stuff. So um, uh, I, he's going to do well. I, I wish him the best. And um, it's um, sorry to see him leave. Okay. Again, for those who have just joined us, see Martin Schubert is on board. Mike Walsh, feel free to uh, go to the Q&A and send in uh, a question or a comment uh, you might have for uh, Yuji Kikuchi. Uh, who is on with us talking MotoGP tonight. UG, uh, five brands in the top 10. We mentioned just how close the championship was. Uh, handicap, uh, if you will, uh, the top five motorcycles in that, uh, in that uh, top 10 of MotoGP. 
where uh, was the Honda in terms of its strengths? Was it handling? Was it top end horsepower? Was it acceleration? Uh, take us through the uh, the five machines, and uh, and in terms of your Honda, uh, where are you guys looking to improve for 2021? Okay, um, let's start with the Hondas because since I know <laughs> I know most of it. Um, Hondas were very, very strong with engine power this year. Um, top end speed was really, really good. Uh, uh, but uh, it lacked a lot of uh, drivability. Uh, it was very difficult to ride. Uh, and unfortunately, we kind of ran out of time and trying to set up a good balance of uh, acceleration, the power application to to the chassis that we were working with. So um, uh, for next year, uh, since we are gonna be, uh, by, by rules, we have to use the same same engine. So we're gonna be working a lot on, on engine and power management uh, to, to improve uh, the races for next year. Um, moving on to Ducati. Uh, Ducati also had top end power. Um, they always have been really, really fast. It's just, uh, and but I see the boys were struggling um, with with the handling and and something. I'm not sure exactly. They they, they had some like um, corner entry issues, uh, and I'm I know that they were struggling with uh, uh, being stable on the braking. So and they never really got to figure this part out. So uh, I'm sure they're going to be working on that part. Mm. Um, uh, Yamaha uh, had some engine issues that were um, that were uh, reliability minded that they needed to improve on, and so they are onto their program and, and trying to get this part sorted out uh, for next year. Um, riders had some. I guess teething with with you know, with handling over last year to this year, uh, so I think they're going to be going back and forth with uh, what is uh, you know the difference in their chassis from their last year to this year, and um, they uh, they're going to be uh, try attempting to improve on that part. Um, for Suzuki, I think uh, the the championship shows that. I think uh, they had the most well-balanced uh, setup as, as in, in the whole paddock. Um, they didn't have incredible top speed, but they had great handling, uh, as they always do. And uh, it was just a great balance. And um, where everybody failed this year, they really stood out because they were consistent with, with how well-balanced their bike was. And uh, I can't say enough about it. Uh, their progress for that. So um, they're going to be uh, working all around, I guess, to, for something for next year. Um, but uh, this year, it was definitely it was uh, it was that well balanced bike that won it. Mm -hmm. um, and to and last KTM, KTM had huge improvements, uh, and and um, I would have to say the riders. Uh, all the riders that were riding, they they have, I think, learned to to get around some of their problems that the bikes have, and and uh, you know they've developed a style that uh, and they figured stuff out that I, I guess um, we're able to get them uh, to 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 run run better. So um, kudos to those guys. They they try real hard, and uh, and uh, I'm sure they're going to be some something new for next year as well. On the KTM, uh, what what were the issues that they were dealing with? But obviously, as you said, their riders were able to ride around those problems, uh, Oliveira with a couple of wins. And was his win just familiarity uh, with that racetrack or that was only a uh, part of the equation why he won the final race? Um, I would have to say that, that um, uh, Oliveira definitely is, you know, his his mental state was pretty strong. Uh, he's this year he's improved quite a bit as far as uh, uh, getting comfortable on the bike and and going 
going fast. Uh, he demonstrated that in Austria when he won. Um, and so uh, he, they, have, they have found some uh, geometry and suspension settings that really started to work with their chassis. Um, and um, the guys, are, guys started signing on to, to that. And so uh, for Oliveira, I think he was, uh, was definitely, he had a positive and a really good energy uh, going into the, well, in the Portimao, the last GP. So and he was he was strong every session, so um, I don't think it was anything fluke. I think it was something that he has, and um, you know um, his mind was very strong, and he was just able to uh, stay up front. So definitely uh, a, a rider to look look out for next year. Okay, Stuart, I think we've got a couple of other questions for uh, for Yuji. Yeah, we do. We have uh, Pete's asked Yuji to tell a favorite story from the Mike Taylor years, maybe even a Brainerd one. He dares you. <laughs> the Brainerd story. Well, uh, there's, there's a few Brainerd stories, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe I shouldn't share the Brainerd stuff. <laughs> but uh, anyways, we, we had some, you know, uh, I guess crashes and things or things uh, things forgotten on a trailer uh, that we really needed uh, that Mike had to uh, go go buy some stuff for us to to get our race weekend going. Uh, that's about as much as I, I guess I can share with him. But uh, but it's uh, yeah <laughs> um, we've we've had some. Great, great times <laughs> with with uh, with Mike. And Stuart, I think we got a couple other uh, questions there for Yuji. Uh, looks like Stuart may have locked up on us. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> Uh, everybody in the beach is using the uh, internet out there. Um, uh, Yuji, <laughs> when uh, when you look back on the, uh, okay, go ahead, Stuart. Are you we there? Um, okay. Oh, okay. We've Oops. lost uh, we've lost Stuart, so we'll uh, we'll get him back on here in a minute. Um, so, uh, Yuji, when you look, uh, you look ahead to the to the season. It seems like a long time till the end of March, but I know you're going to be busy in between there uh, with uh, building motorcycles and and uh, and tests uh, and all that. Uh, how much of an off season uh, is it, or is there an off season uh, with all the things that you've got to get done to prepare? For the opening round at Qatar, which comes up on May, uh, March the twenty eighth. Right. Uh, well, this this year I seem to have a little bit more time than usual. Uh, they've delayed uh, the the beginning. Normally, uh, first week of January is when I would be going to Japan to go build the new bikes. Uh, that would give me about a month off just during Christmas and so uh, New Year's I go. But uh, this year. Uh, I'm not scheduled to go, uh, so that will give me up to the end of end of January. So I have a little bit more time this year. Um, but um, again, that once once we get to Malaysia for the testing, I'm sure I'm going to be busy trying to catch up from uh, things that I needed to do in Japan uh, that we'll be doing in in Japan. What about? So, uh, uh, the, go ahead, Yuji. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this year I'll, I'll have about two months. Okay, to build uh, build your primary bike and and prepare the spare bikes. What uh, what is going to be different next year in terms of any rule changes, uh, and uh, on the technical side uh, in terms of what you can do with the motorcycle? I assume everybody has to stay with the. Uh, with the same power plant, but uh, what other changes can you make to the bike for 2021? 
I, I believe, uh, like you said, uh, uh, the, the power plant has to stay the same, so the engine uh, is, is locked in, it's frozen. Um, but the chassis is, is all a go, and uh, I haven't really looked at the, if there's any updates to the 2021 uh, regulations. But as far as I know, um, you know, in, in, in Grand Prix, you know, the chassis and, and swing arms, and a lot of, a lot of these parts will kind of change on the fly. So uh, throughout the season, we'll be going through different frames and different uh, parts of the bike to, to keep improving. So I'm sure this will be uh, the same for next year. Okay, looks like we've got uh, Stuart back. Stuart, uh, I think you got to unmute yourself and then give us those other uh, questions that uh, the folks uh, on the show tonight had for you, G. All right, looks like uh, Stuart's still trying to get on board here. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll give him another uh, couple of minutes. Maybe he can get back on here. We have about uh, 10 minutes before we go. Um, looking back over the 15 uh, races uh, in the uh, MotoGP Championship, Yuji, is there one or two uh, events uh, that stand out uh, where uh, it was either, you know, one of the Honda riders with a particularly inspired ride or or one of these young chargers just coming out of nowhere and, and winning the race. Um, in terms of this year, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what can I say? There were, there were a few races that were quite exciting. Um, Does it all melt together after all the travel and all the 15 races? Oh, oh absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It just, it just melts uh, through as one wind glob. <laughs> but I'd have to say, uh, you know, uh, I'd have to say it's the Suzuki riders really were impressive, impressive to watch uh, between Alex Springs and, 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 uh, Johan Mir, um, what they can commit to do going into the corners or, or how they could um, flip from one corner to another, just the maneuver that they can do with these bikes are just quite impressive to watch. And um, I just kind of remember thinking, uh, hoping that uh, wish, wish our, our bike could, <laughs> could do that. But um, definitely uh, impressive to watch. Um, uh, Yuji, something I wanted to, uh, to bring up, uh, because eventually that's where, uh, we're heading. I know MotoGP had Moto E, I believe that got shelved for the most part, uh, this year. Uh, where do you see 10 years from now? If you can look in your crystal ball, are we still going to be running, uh, internal combustion, uh, power plants or, are we looking at some kind of a, uh, a Moto E championship where these uh, bikes are going to be battery powered, electric? Right. Um, I would think uh, the, the engine will still be in 10 years from now. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some different regulations and, and restrictions along the way. Um, the Moto E uh, introduction has been for a couple of years now, and uh, I, I am thinking that they are starting to build on on this uh, for the future of, of Grand Prix. But um, so I, I would think in ten years from now you'll see both platforms. But I would think that the the Moto E would be um, as improved as far as uh, the the whole venue itself. It, uh, I, I, I would think that it's become larger. And I would think all of the Japanese and European manufacturers are working on their uh, e-technology. Have you had a, a chance to look in into that? Have you been involved in that in any way? Uh, no, I haven't directly been involved in it, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I've seen the model e bikes and they're, they're quite simple as far as, uh, you know, the, the electrical, uh, technology uh, compared to, let's say, the Formula E for the cars. Um, 
the Formula E seems to have a lot of um, uh, new generation type of uh, techniques and and and, and uh, technologies built in. Um, motor e-bikes right now, has, I think, is more of an introductory phase, and uh, um, it's a it's it's a lot simpler compared to the, where the cars are right now. Okay, um, I know that uh, you know uh, in your years uh, in uh, tuning for. Yoshimer and then Honda in the U.S. Uh, and you had the, uh, you know, the pleasure of working with uh, Nikki Hayden. The next uh, American rider headed over there is uh, Cameron Bobier. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with him, but what's the general talk about uh, Cameron Bobier after winning all the Moto America Superbike Championships headed to Moto2? And I assume if he's successful there, it won't be long before they're looking to move him on up to uh, MotoGP. Any talk about uh, Bobier and and where he might be headed in a in a couple of years? I have heard some stories about that uh, from Cameron coming to to do Moto Two, so I'm I'm a little excited about that uh, to see more of the riders from from the you know the Moto America platform coming over to do. Uh, any type of racing, be it, be it you know Moto Moto Two or um, or you know even younger ones with the Moto Three. So it's um, I'm I'm excited to see him see him come over. Um, I think he's going to do great. Um, although I have to say that uh, Moto Moto Two is for me. I, I still see uh, like what we used to see in 600 production race at Chernobyl or something. You know, it's. Yeah. It's very competitive, and it's about you know a lot of a lot of riding and a lot of um, strategies involved in trying to try to win that race. And I and I think a lot of that applies to Moto Two as well. So um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, Cameron come on and 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 give it give it a shot on the Moto Two. Okay, uh, we have Stuart Nodell back. I don't think we've got video, but Stuart, maybe your microphone is working. And if it is, uh, if you could give us those last couple of questions for Yuji. Yeah, we've lost the questions, Pat, because I got completely disconnected. And when I came back in, they're, they're <laughs> out of the queue. So unfortunately, they're gone. Um, like I said, I knew there was one question from Nathan Naslin, but I don't remember what it was off the top of my head. So. If he puts it in the Q&A now, I could uh, fire that off to you, G. Okay, we'll uh, try to get <laughs> Nathan's uh, a question in here before we, uh, before we uh, sign off. Um, Yuji, in terms of all of the uh, Canadian riders that you worked with when you're here uh, in the Canadian Championship for, uh, for all of those years, uh, we're gonna put you on the spot here. Uh, rank all those riders. <laughs> I know there's Taylor, there's Crevier, and uh, I'm trying to think maybe Jordan Zolk in there as uh, as well. No, I never got to work no, with Jordan. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I thought although, maybe you had for no, a little bit. But I work with I work with Pascal. Okay. So Pascal, um, Pascal, Taylor, and uh, and uh, and Crevier. And you can rank them Miguel. whatever the most fun uh, to work with, etc. Most fun to work with, uh, it would have to be Mike Taylor. And we just the the, the stories in our dramas we 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 call it the Taylor vortex. Uh, but um, things just happen, you know, at at, at at any given weekend with Michael Taylor, and and it, it was it was. Uh, we, we we do have a few stories about that. So definitely the most fun uh, to work with was Mark Taylor. Um, Pascal, I got to work with him for one year uh, before he went on to Harley Davidson at Yoshimura. But uh, uh, great great rider to work with, so talent. And uh, and uh, and uh, Steve Crevier, I worked with him two years. Yes. Um, and he's Steve's always like a Sunday guy, you know. Given a, a Sunday race, he he can get out there and he can win. So um, pleasure to work with him.
Okay, I think we got a couple of more questions here from Stuart. Can you get to those questions, Stuart? I can, Pat. Uh, we're just hoping, or Nathan Asen was asking, if, he was hoping that you could tell a Mike Taylor story, but maybe if not, uh, he just there could did. be a book down the road. <laughs> I think he wanted the Brainerd story, but maybe in a book. <laughs> All right, stay, stay, stay tuned. Uh, any other questions are for you, G. Stewart? No, they're all clear in the Q and A. Okay, because I'm seeing three there. Okay, and what about the the little PowerPoint with some of those photos? Can you throw that up? Yeah, I can run through those. Okay, can, and we'll, yeah. we'll let uh, we'll let you, G. Uh, talk about these uh, as we uh, send out. There's the uh, lineup. And oh, uh, 2021 lineup. Okay. Yeah, we can go back to that. Where where's this photo, uh, Yuji? This is you and your son. <laughs> yeah, this is our home in Texas. Uh, my son Logan, uh, he's got his uh, his uh, Pee Wee 50 there. So um, does he ride or race? Yeah. Nope. He uh, oh. doesn't race, but he 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 does ride around here. Um, just just starting to enjoy it. Okay. But, uh, I think Perfect. he like he wants he likes to ride when I ride. So um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm I'm sure he's gonna be taking more time to ride his bike. Okay, and there's the lineup for uh, 2021. I'm sure you know all of uh, all of these guys. Should be uh, a great 2021 season. Pretty aggressive schedule with 20. 20 races, uh, MotoGP will do well if they can get all mm -hmm. 20 races in. And uh, there you see uh, Mark Marquez is, uh, what stage is he at? Is it, uh, is he close to being a hundred percent or does he still uh, on the mend? I think from the last I heard, I think he is still on the mend. Um, something's uh, needed. Um, and you need to go back to, to do another operation and stuff. So this is from what I heard. I uh, haven't heard the whole story. They're not they're not speaking a whole lot about it. But well, um, hopefully he's I, ready I, I to go for March. Still on the mend. Okay. Yes. Go ahead, Stuart. We got a couple of more there. Where's uh, where's all? Yeah, right so right, that's Mark's team. And this is. Uh, Nakagami, with the champion guys. Uh, we're going fast forward through. There's the uh, KTM, the Aprilia. Uh-huh. You have the Tech 3 KTM. That's the factory KTM team. And then you've got the, uh, this is the two Moto2 riders that are coming up to the Ducati uh, satellite squad. Right. Look at Marini, he's been pretty strong. And yeah, Jorge yeah. Martin and, uh, definitely coming up. Miller had uh, a couple of really good rides to the end of the season. So I, as interesting as this season was in MotoGP, I think next year, uh, could be even more. And Yuji, you got to be excited about uh, having uh, Marquez as the rider you'll be working with. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to to start next year with with Alex. Awesome. He's going to be, yeah. Well, Yuji, uh, I know it was uh, was a long season. Good that you're back home in McKinney, Texas, with your uh, with your family. Uh, enjoy the uh, the time off, and uh, we uh, will extend it. Tomorrow's December, so we'll extend uh, a happy holidays to you and your family. Stay safe, and uh, we're going to check in with you, I think, as we get a little bit closer to the start of the MotoGP season, see how the tests have gone, and uh, uh, maybe get a little prediction from you on how 2021 is going to go. All right. Thanks, Pat. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be on here again and uh, catch up with you guys. All right. Sorry, my, uh, my camera is not working. <laughs> it's all right. 
Uh, neither's was Stewart's for a while. So. <laughs> yeah, mine wasn't. Mine wasn't much <laughs> two two DNFs. That's it. Anyways, that's great, right. uh, that's right. great talking to you. I'm sure everybody online here tonight uh, enjoy the chat, and we're able to answer a bunch of uh, the questions. So, I uh, want to thank uh, Yuji Kakuchi again for being our guest on Track Announcers Notebook. Uh, to uh, my co-host, uh, Stuart Nodell. Have a, a safe week, and we'll see you back here next Monday night at 8 p.m. for another edition of Track Announcers Notebook. Have a great week. Stay safe and uh, be well. Thanks again, Eugene. Thank you, guys. Okay.